A yeah. pro is this substance feels really good. A con is this substance feels really good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 100% you know though, yeah. So believe it or not, this is actually the third podcast I've done with CG Kid. And for reasons I'm not going to list here, but sometimes things are out of your control. Uh, which is a, another way of saying that I'm a freaking moron and I fucked up. But, as they say, third time's the charm and there's always a blessing in disguise when it comes to these situations. Or that's what I tell myself anyway. But anyways, I'm sure a lot of you guys who follow my channel would have heard of CG Kid by now. I did a collaboration with him a few weeks ago. CG Kid, aka Philip, is one of the few guys on YouTube who was doing drug education right, in my opinion. I think he's a very genuine dude who really just wants to help and the, this guy's experiences with drug addiction is really inspiring. Like he really went into a dark hole and got himself into really tricky situations, particularly with hardcore substance abuse, with heroin, crystal meth and things like that. And he's got some pretty crazy stories. and. More importantly, a lot of wisdom, and he dedicates most of his time, pretty, pretty much all his time, helping addicts, you know, and to reduce the stigma of drug addiction, and I applaud him for what he's doing, I know this is just a fucking, just jacking him off here and blowing smoke up his ass, but he's actually a really, really good dude, and I think that you guys should definitely show him some love, check out his YouTube channel, subscribe. And check out Shameless Protocol. I think what he's doing over there is really cool. Now, for those who want to check out the very first conversation we had, check out the link in the description box below and go to my iTunes or you can go to my website. You know, I have an audio exclusive podcast with CG Kid. And I don't exactly remember what we went into, but I remember it was a really good conversation. <laughs> so go check that out if you want to see that. Uh, we talk about different things here because I didn't want to repeat what we went over. The first couple of times but i really hope you enjoy this podcast guys and yeah show us some love you know sharing this around and letting people know and getting this podcast out there you know it's very difficult these days to grow a brand especially when you talk about taboo topics and it's because of you guys that share this stuff around that makes it possible for this message to to spread you know so if you want to support this channel and get early access to podcasts and exclusive content then check out patreon a lot of cool stuff over there we also released new merch so we got this cool third eye wolf and this i'm offended that you're offended t-shirt <laughs> sponsor guys i'm stoked to announce that i finally found a product that i can genuinely stand behind so bear blend is a premier line of certified organic addictive free herbal ceremonial blends and liquid herbs i don't know what bear blend have done whether it's voodoo witch magic or whatnot but they've definitely hit the nail on the head and what's really cool about these herbal blends is that they can be enjoyed in a tea, a pipe, rolling paper, or if you want to be a part of the cool kids and go vape nation style. And don't stress about it being K2 or spice, tobacco, weed, or any nasty synthetic compounds. Bear Blends is all organic herbs and nothing else. Personally, I've been using the liquid herbs to substitute weed and just to kind of wind down after a long day. But you can also mix these herbs with your tobacco or even weed if you want. It's up to you what you want to do, but I can assure you that Bear Blend is a legit company that aligns with my own core values, so they definitely resonate with me. But yeah, show them some love. Check out bearblend.com and use the promo code YOURMATETOM, all one word, at the checkout for a 10% discount. How good's that, mate? Anyways, guys, much love. Enjoy the podcast. Yeah, how you been? Good, man. Can't get enough of me, can you? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to? Uh, not really much lately, actually. Just kind of yeah. getting over my dog's death, I suppose, in a, in, uh -huh. in a way. It's all good. It was more like the first few days, which was like really fucking tough. And then that, yeah, just the whole fucking grieving. I just never thought a dog could produce such powerful emotions like that. It's fucking crazy. Hey, Tammy wants to say hi. Okay. <laughs> hey. Hello? I heard Hello? Voice. Hey, how, how are, are you? you? I'm good. What's good going on with you guys? Hey. Not much. The, the cat got its bed fixed. Oh yeah. So the cat's happy. So we're happy. <laughs> I'll go get the cat real quick to say hello. The infamous Here cat. To get the cat. Yeah. What time is it in Australia? Uh, quarter to three, in the PM. 
in the p.m. It's 11.42 p.m. here. Yeah, it's past yeah. my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do this, bro. We're back again. All right, guys. So for those listening at home and do not know, this is our third podcast together because I'm a moron. And I... <laughs> so the first time I didn't record the video, the second time I deleted it because I had to wipe my hard drive from my Mac and then that got lost in the mix. I was like... I was so pissed off for a moment, and then I'm like, you know what, fuck it, there's always a blessing in disguise in these kind of situations, so. Hell yeah, bro, we've become good friends for this process, we've podcasted like three times by now. Yeah, we're experts now, exactly. (laughs) You know me better than I know myself. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Uh, I wanted, because you know the Q&A that we did, there was a few questions that I didn't leave in the video just because i wanted to make it short but there was something i want to start off this uh podcast with uh religion good old religion why not uh there was there was a someone asked you a question something to do with like do you believe in a higher power and like something to do with aa and what's your thoughts on that because your upbringing was catholic right uh my upbringing was actually messianic jew which is uh like a a jew for jesus so we do like the cultural yeah, we do like the Hava Megillah stuff and the matzah and like Passover. Oh, that's that's but crazy. We're Christian. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's like uh, Jews for Jesus. So it has a um, nice ring to it, doesn't it? Yeah, Jews, Jews for, for Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jesus was a Jew, bro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but what's your... Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start. Why not start this podcast? Well, the like, the higher power God. concept, the religion concept. This is um, something that I disagree with a lot and you know, 12 step programs where they put God all over the wall and they say, you know, we're a spiritual program. We're not religious. And I'm yeah. like, dude, you guys are praying. There's God everywhere. And I'm very sensitive towards that, even though I find spirituality through religion, you know, which is very negatively stigmatized. Like I could go out and say I'm struggling with an addiction to cocaine and people are like, Oh, I hope you get yeah. better. If I am a Christian, I literally, they bring out the lynch. Like that's how I feel about it. There's but a definite is there a reason though, why you don't like that they you don't agree with them putting religion yeah even in though I am, is it because of you or is it because of other people not agreeing with it yeah even though i find sp- spirituality through religion i have great respect for people that don't like right. i have yeah. great respect for the atheist the agnostic any religion like it doesn't matter to me yeah. at all so i think it just sends a false signal that you know you need god as a prerequisite for sobriety and that's not the case for everybody and for the people that don't believe in god it's usually really deep rooted you know uh, it's usually something that they've a belief they've had for a long time that it's a strongly held belief and it's hard enough to just get sober, but to come in and challenge that belief mm. and you don't even know that person's background, you know, someone who's an atheist, it could be because of pure logic or something traumatizing happened to him as a result of organized religion, right? They willing to let go of and it's like, dude, you're someone's going in there they get sober. That's a huge step. But asking them to like pray and stuff, that's just mm. adding that I don't feel like are necessary because the con really what the higher power is is um it's any force which supersedes your will whenever you're about to do something wrong whatever the case may be and something stops you like for instance um you're gonna go relapse but you don't want to let down your son or mm. whatever or let down a family member or a loved one so that stops you even though it's your will to use something superseded your will at some point in your life right. something outside something of you else, yeah. So what uh, the higher power is, is just fostering a relationship with that, whether that be the truth, whether that be love. If it's love for your family, then you foster that and you build like a conscious connection with it. And uh, the reason that that's important is if you're going out to relapse, you aren't going to call your counselor. You're not going to call your mom. You're not going to call your friends. You already decided I'm going to use. I'm on my way. The only hope you have of anything stopping you is a conscious contact with something that's more internal. Mm. In other words, like something that intervenes whenever I would go out to relapse it would be like my brain was in a civil war there was like this instinctual drive to just use and get that instant gratification and there was the belief system and they would fight back and forth and I would jumble between the two and uh, by strengthening your belief system which I think is your higher power your morals your connection with who you love right uh, that would kick in a lot sooner and with a lot more power and uh, hopefully it'll kick in before you go to drink. For me, it actually happened one time where I was going to relapse. 
and that that belief system kicked in. I already bought the alcohol, but I ended up pouring it out just because of that belief system kicking in. What happened? Can you walk us through that? Like what made you think? Like, well, so you me, bought the alcohol like and then you ended up throwing it out, right? Yeah. Yeah. For me in that particular experience, it was the, you know, my higher power comes in many forms. And in that case, it was the truth. It was just the idea of I was going at it with the mentality of nobody will know. And then I, I hit this feeling of I will know. And that was more important to me. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I will have to live with this. Am I okay with that? And um, I really questioned. I was like, yeah, I'll feel great for the next hour or two. But how am I going to feel? I started playing the tape. And I think the truth is kind of what kicked in in that situation to where I was like, you know, nobody will know, whatever. But I will know this isn't really going to be that great. Maybe I've played this up. And I ended mm -hmm. up just pouring it out and calling my friends and telling them. Is that what you do in those kind of situations? You have support and you call someone yeah you know, having a support network is so critical and there's yeah. so many people that don't have that but just other people who are like-minded who are you know after some kind of spiritual progression it doesn't have to be that they're getting sober but having a close mm. network of people that are thriving and trying to find spiritual progression and serenity or healthy good friends is so important in recovery because doing it just getting sober and staying sober sucks, but doing it alone, <laughs> to me, it's just miserable. It's like, yeah. I might as well. I know what you mean, like just being, I, I think just isolation is the cause to many mental illnesses and just makes depression, anxiety and, and addictive tendencies just worse because you don't have that support network. And it's really important because like humans are very social creatures. So we need, we need people, we need connection. Yeah. Unless I, I guess you know there are some people that that would you know just go off to a mountain somewhere and just meditate their whole life and I don't need nobody that kind of thing. But <laughs> <laughs> most people do know they needed that, and it's you know there's a social reward system in the brain that releases dopamine. Talking actually releases dopamine, and uh, having those friends you can really rely on, and just you know thinking back and how those relationships have grown especially in recovery. That's one of the perks of recovery. Like in addiction, I'll never say that my friends didn't care about me. They always did. You know, right. they loved me. I using friends. I'm talking about, you know, the friends that were stoners that were maybe alcoholic, but I don't diagnose other people. Okay. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I know they did about. love me like they did. But the thing is they love the substance more than they love themselves. Mm. So of course they love the substance more than me. So there's always that barrier in that relationship. Of you, you know deep down that if it, if they had to choose between alcohol or you, they're going to choose alcohol because they choose that over themselves. Yeah. So when you enter in recovery, a perk of recovery is having healthy relationships where you can have a close bond and there isn't this thing that's getting in the way of the relationship. And uh, any perks in recovery that you can find, go after them because I didn't get sober to be miserable. I don't think many people do. Yeah, I know. So I know. perks and benefits to being sober and actually like – building off of those is so critical because how are you going to be happy if you're not chasing that yeah and it's hard transitioning to the sober life because drugs obviously give you massive amounts of pleasure that's incomparable to anything else in life so then when you go back to your normal life your i guess pleasure levels go down a lot so it's i don't it's hard man because it's you got to somehow reach this middle ground because obviously with these great highs come these great lows and yeah. yeah, it's something I definitely struggled with because I used to hang out with like uh, what we call bogans. I guess uh, you can call them Australian rednecks. You know, just people, we just like to drink, smoke weed, get fucked up and do all these kind of things all the time. Uh, I think that's pretty much the case with all Australians. We definitely love our alcohol. I remember we used to drink, uh, you know, do you guys have like those boxed wines? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we call it goon, right? G-O-O-N. A lot of kids drink it because it's like 10 bucks for like, you know, four liters of wine. Yeah. So yeah, we used to just do that. and oh, ugh. Even to this day, I can't drink white wine. But yeah. it's fucking, yeah. But I know what you mean, like just having that, I don't know, a group that cares more about getting fucked up than they do about their own friends. And they're like, they're good people, like you're saying. Like they, of course, uh, mm -hmm. we loved it. There was definitely a, a mutual respect and all that kind of stuff, but yeah, when it comes to like alcohol or drugs or that kind of lifestyle or you, they're usually going to choose the substance, and yeah. it's definitely tough to break out of that.
Like that's said, you know, yeah. that's why recovery is so difficult because there's so much change that goes on, and a lot of addicts, including myself, we bite up more than we can chew. Like in other words, it's like. What do you mean by that? Like for me, I'm an extremist personality, and for some reason, this seems to be a commonality among addicts is that we either do something to the full extent or we just don't do it at all, and that's kind of like. Yeah, doing drugs my personality. Also, it's like a, a career like i'm going to try everything this is like my college you know what i mean yeah like everything i do it's not like i'm going to do it a little bit i'm going to do it a lot yeah and that carries so that, over through everything right because like for me it yeah, wasn't just with drugs it, ha- it happened with youtube it happened with spirituality it happened with psychedelics like whatever new thing i got into i just went full force yeah. into that which isn't healthy i learned from the in the long run but yeah yeah life. and that's that's the bridge of recovery because I see it all the time where addicts are overcommitting. Like they're right. acting like by staying s- sober one day that they have to stay sober the rest of their life. Mm. You know what I mean? Like they act by like if they go to one support group meeting, then they can never use again. Like they're literally projecting so much of the future. I'm like, bro, just go to one <laughs> if you want to. Like it's up to you. But right. going to a meeting doesn't mean you have to commit like your job and lose your job and get in recovery and right, go to rehab. Right, And if you relapse, they be- make themselves, they put themselves down a lot. Uh, it's definitely with, like even with myself, I usually put myself down a lot, which is not good. But I feel like this creates like a, a more of a separation because, you know, as you know, your personality isn't just like one entity. It's like these, all these different selves. You've got like your addictive personality. You've got your kind self, your asshole self, whatever you want to call it. So, when you do finally relapse or, you know, you smoke or join or drink alcohol, whatever you're trying to quit, and then you make yourself feel bad about it, now you're just separating that part of yourself and creating more of a gap. Do you find yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is a very common problem in recovery that even I've dealt with because when you've been using substances for so long, a lot of times you're using them to solve a problem that you had previously to the using. Right. So like the war on drugs sees drugs as the problem. No, drugs are actually the solution. The problems usually occur before the substance is used. Yeah. Well, definitely. for their whole life, you know, even including the using, they've identified themselves as an addict mm. to an extent. Like they, you know, I, I used the first time because I didn't have any friends. I felt like I was worthless. I had a poor self-esteem. So then I poured alcohol or drugs on that. And of course, all that got worse and worse and worse. Mm. So when I got sober, there was little distinction between the sober me and the addicted. Yeah. Hello? You only deserve bad things to happen to you. Hang on, can you go back a little bit? You just uh, cut out for a bit. Yeah, I can tell you you froze a bit. Uh, I... But like, it's basically... Uh... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah addicts and myself like you know we use as a solution for these problems we, we might have had before our addiction and then you get sober and it's really hard to differentiate the sober you versus the addicted you mm. like because that's all i knew i only knew the me that was addicted and even before substances it was just escape it was video games this that or the other because of anxiety issues poor self-esteem oh yeah and video and games so- is massive because like people don't really treat it as a big problem but if you re- like Video games was my very first addiction in life. Because, like, yeah. like, you know, you have, like, this virtual world where you can escape your own reality and be this avatar that's worth something and, you know, have these cool advent- adventures and you don't have to deal with this kind of thing. So, it's, like, for me, that I would consider that, like, my first true drug because I was so... I'm not calling it a drug. I'm not saying that video games are harmful, but the way I did it, because, like, you know, we just talked about before, we have very extreme personalities, so... When I did go into video games, it was like f- absolute obsession, like eight hours a day for years and years and years. It was fucking crazy. It wasn't good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, me- I remember getting sober and it was just really hard to distinct like who I was. I didn't know who I was. Like looking back, I was discovering who I am. So it was very easy to fall into the trap of shame, which is, you know, the guilt is feeling bad for something you did in the past. Guilt is actually very healthy. But you're different, separating it from who you are. Whereas shame, it's like I'm identifying myself with what I did in the past. So I've done shitty things, so I must be a shitty person, and that's what I deserve. I mean, I've learned to basically um, be responsible only for my side of the street. And yeah. that has been such a serenity thing, because now it's like I am not responsible for how anybody else feels, thinks, whatever. So like, I never take a joke bad. 
But when someone does and I can maybe see their point, I still make amends, even if they totally brought it on and set themselves <laughs> up. For some reason, I make amends and it makes me feel better. I know, man. It's, you got to pick your battles too. Yeah. yeah. Society, bro. Like, yeah, people yeah. don't make amends. People do not apologize. I mean, I, like, I was thinking, I don't remember the last time anyone's ever made, like, an apology to me formally. Like, they went up to me and said, I apologize for this. What could I do to make it right? Just doesn't happen. Yeah, whoa. Now that I think about it, yeah, no one's... When you do it, it, when you do it, it's weird. It feels weird. It feels wrong. It feels awkward. But after you do it, you realize good, that... Yeah. It's inspiring, like, to even the person that received the amends a lot of times, because, like, well, that never happens. Nobody ever just says, I'm wrong for this part. Mm. You know, people always do an amends, and they always want to pull up what the other person did to evoke something. But to just go in and apologize for your part and let them deal with their side of the street, it's so liberating oh, in definitely. recovery. It's definitely good to drop your ego once in a while, because yeah, no one yeah. does that. It's like they're just embarrassed it's like we forget that like we are humans we fuck up it's kind of part of the part of the package yeah yeah how are you doing with your whole youtube situation like are you getting trouble because oh youtube is yeah uh, they're going through such a change right now like i believe that and um i kind of sympathize for their situation because they're getting all kinds of stuff if you really go in and dig deep into like the news like news.google.com you'll see that like, I don't even think I should say it on this video, but a lot of bad things are happening to them. And they're trying to fix this hole that they've kind of dug. Mm. And I think that, the, you know, everything will be all right. I, you know, I think that they're going to come back and do Everything's going to be all right. Everything's yeah, I feel, right. I feel optimistic regarding what they're doing. I just think they move really slow. Whereas, like, yeah. Facebook is bad, dude. I know Instagram what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Like we had live Facebook streaming from a computer back in 2016. I think YouTube just released that. And I'm like, dude, you work so slow. <laughs> and they're talking about, you know, they did beta for sponsorships on channels and they're going to deploy it. That's what they were, Suzanne was saying. And I'm like, dude, it's been like a month and a half. Like, like why are we waiting? What yeah, I think, waiting? I think from, I watched a video on that. I think they're going to take like 30% of the cut of that. See, I wouldn't, I, that or would bother me a little bit, but I would deal with it. I would deal with it. Yeah, fuck it. Yeah, it's their platform, I guess. You like, they, just, I'm glad the they're actually giving content creators a little more leverage because the advertising, yeah. the truth is, and I get so upset because the way advertisers are represented, it's like we look like the biggest douchebags ever because it's like we're pulling up advertising because we're showing up on random videos, you know, like whatever. That's not why we're pulling advertising. That is not why. And that's like big community because I work in digital marketing, so I manage these mass accounts. We pull out because the interface in AdWords sucks. That's hmm. why. And you can't specifically target, say, a channel. And that's a big problem. Like, you know, as a business owner, I would want to target only highly relevant channels. So if I was like a rehab, it would make sense to target my channel because yeah. it's talking about addictive substances exactly people who need rehab like a mother who's concerned about her son and doing research into cocaine addiction that stumbles upon my video and then there's a ad for right, rehab right. great high relevancy but the problem is youtube won't let you do placement targeting that's what they call it what are they, they do is will, like, will, are they going to change that because it seems like a well what they do answer. their current system is all right so you make an ad and then you basically um google approves the ad they approve the website landing page they approve yeah. the ad so I actually did this with Psych Substance Channel because I was marketing for a festival okay. and they wanted to target Psych Substance. They were also doing psychedelic t-shirts. Okay. So they wanted to target him only uh, and that was it. And uh, oh. basically, Adam got a notification that we were trying to target and he had to approve the ad. Oh. Unless he got it and go live, but he doesn't get an email. I've tested notification system. It's broken. And also, every AdWords account only gets one chance in its lifetime to market on a channel and i'm like this is just dumb man like i'm i would essentially be re-monetizing a channel because the way it works with advertising on youtube it's a bidding structure so like say a rehab came in and started marketing on my channel mm. then another rehab comes in and they start bidding for views well the bids would go up and then the youtuber would be monetized through high relevancy so it just it really frustrates me when it comes down to it that YouTube is acting like this is a problem with the content on our website and they're neglecting the ad interface. Like why the heck does Adam have to approve an ad if it's already been approved by Google? Mm. And then why aren't you sending him an email? Why isn't the notification highlighted? 
letting them know that, hey, someone wants to re-monetize your demonetized video. But no, and none something of that. that's relevant as well. But then I'll get like a fucking Toyota ad on my video, which is like nothing to do with anything. We see it as the user. We see that ads have no relevancy. You'll be on like a yoga channel and you get an ad for like beer or something. (laughs) But it's like you get the most random stuff that doesn't correlate. And that's because as advertisers, we can't narrowly target an audience. It just doesn't work. Uh, What are are your thoughts on all these uh, weed tubers getting shut down? Oh, with that, like I... I filled out a survey for YouTube and I, I stated my honest opinions in it. And I, yeah. you know, what they're doing is I could see how they're promoting substance abuse, um, regardless of how benign the substance is, it is illegal in some states. So that alone is inherently dangerous. Yeah. Well, it's, it's uh, still illegal federally, even if it is legal in some states, yeah, it's still yeah. illegal federally. It has dangers. I've seen people get addicted to it. I've seen to personalization disorder and these guys, to an extent, are promoting it. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, like, I, I don't think that they deserve to get their channel shut down, but they should have gotten a warning being like, Oi, you've got, you know, 48 hours to delete all your videos where you smoke weed. Or, you know, something like that. But That's what I was I saying. I know you mean. Like, cause the some people channel on private, say you have three months to yeah, clean up yeah, your or whatever. Yeah, you however can't post or do anything. You're gone for three months, but then we'll bring you back. Yeah. You know, anything anything I got to respect because for me what I said is to them is you know if a video was fine for over a year like there should be some kind of leniency because as a content creator if you striked me for a video I made a year ago well I would have learned from that mistake I would have redone my content in a different oh, way yeah, yeah definitely but understand the guidelines better but it's like all of a sudden they're going back I saw a guy got a strike on a video that was eight years old Whoa. And I'm like, you know, strike them eight years ago, then maybe he'd be more aware for the oh, following yeah. eight years. And you change a lot in eight years. That's a little bit. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like getting in trouble for, I don't know, for doing something stupid when you were a kid. It's like, oh, fuck, I'm a different person now. With YouTube, I'm I'm supportive of, to an extent of what they're doing. I'm just not as supportive of how they're doing it. And I think they could do it better with a little bit more of like, man... We were cool with this for 16 years. Now, all of a sudden, <laughs> we're not. Like, let's just terminate these channels. Oh, yeah, because people have been smoking weed on camera since the beginning, right? Like, it's been a long yeah. time thing. Oh, yeah, dude. It's been going on forever. And some of these guys have some massive channels that probably pay the bills. And it's like, you're who, stripping who, who, them. Who are some big YouTubers that got shut down? See, I don't even know their names. Yeah, I just know okay. that yeah, there, there was some. But, um... You know, and also, like, what happened, it was a horrible thing that happened. It was traumatizing where that woman, you know, went into YouTube headquarters and ended up committing suicide. And, um, oh, yeah, you know, her crazy. content was getting restricted and she wasn't mentally stable. And that's what happened. You know, like, she wasn't there mentally. And that's it. You know, and uh, my heart goes out to her family. But I think when you shut down all these channels, you got to realize not all these people are mentally stable. Like mm. you got to start seeing it as like this is actually a concern. Like, and it, what hurts the most is how they don't communicate. That, like, they could almost shut down a channel and just communicate with us, and I think we would actually feel better about it, mm. even if they kept it terminated. But it's like you hit them and you get a templated response. You can tell someone just clicked a button. <laughs> That's the worst, <laughs> isn't it? And like you've put so much time and effort like filling out this essay and they just give you this response that's like, it doesn't matter what you would have said, they would have just sent the same message. Yeah, it's yeah, very frustrating. And they, they apparently are communicating through Twitter, which I haven't really used yet. I don't know. How, they say their response rate 75%, oh, but I think that's the media, man. I hate adding another, like YouTube in and of itself is enough for me. Let alone yeah, like social Facebook. media is so ridiculous. And honestly, like people want me to do videos on porn addiction like every day. Every day I get a text, will you do really? a video on porn Oh, God. <laughs> like, every- so you haven't done it- a video on porn addiction? I've never done because I, I never have had it. You never had it? But I mean, like, dude, I, I watch porn daily, <laughs> but it's like, we're talking about addiction. <laughs> I'm not addicted. I just watch it every single day and I can't live without it. But no, nah, I'm not addicted. <laughs> Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, I watch it every day. <laughs> that could be in denial. Yeah. I might need I, intervention. I think I'm so. Need... I'm going to call you out, CG kid. I think you're addicted to porn. Well, <laughs> I was fine. I was doing fine until I found out, like, they do, like, porn, porn with the hoverboard and, like... What? Yeah. Can you come again? Explain that, please. 
Well, it's like there'll be like a T Rex, like a blow up T Rex on a hoverboard, and he's like chasing down to like a Latina chick. <laughs> okay. It's totally next level fetish stuff. Are man. you serious? This is a real thing. Uh, I, I I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel. Like, I don't feel port addiction is as common as people think it is. I mean, I could be lying to myself, but I went to a Sex Addicts Anonymous meeting once because um, how did that go? I never get laid, so I was watching porn a lot. Okay. And it, it did seem kind of excessive, but then I walked into that meeting and I walked out and I realized really? from what oh. I shared there that some like true sex addiction or porn addiction is like watching it eight hours a day you can't go to work okay so you went in he's like oh my god you guys are really fucked up i'm fucking yeah okay like i'm watching to help me go to sleep at night for like 10 minutes every night okay i mean i'm watching weirder stuff than i used to but but you know like the reason i I brought that up is no judgment bro i know porn is it's very tempting i'm the same but anyway yeah I don't see it, but now when it comes to social media addiction, oh, oh god, that's, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's why I have to step. Yeah, back. it's like there's yeah. no light around it, but you know, like uh, the ages between uh, eight and twelve years old use social media six hours a day, and then twelve to seventeen on average is nine hours a day. What? And I, I wish I could reference my source. This is based on a survey that was done. I uh, think it was by Common Media. It's okay. I'm not, um, it sounds like a thing. Must be true. Yeah, <laughs> it's done by Common Media. I'm almost positive. Uh, okay. So it is credible. Like, but yeah. the thing is, like, when you have these nine-year-olds on social media six hours a day, well, each push notification actually triggers a that dopamine, dopamine. Release, yeah, a yeah, social yeah. system. Yeah. And uh, it, it's scary because you don't know like how this is gonna affect society. Also, like family dynamic. As far as like family sitting down at dinner and like actually having dinner together, there's a lot more of the everybody's on their phone. Oh, let's order some from like Uber Eats. Disconnection. Yeah. Well, even because like, you're, 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 you know, you you talked about this study or whatever, but I don't even I don't think you need a scientific study to tell you that we're fucking addicted to social media. It's just walk outside and just have a, a look. It's a bigger you know? problem than people think it's gonna be. I really I so strong. Too. Well, that's the price we're of technology, the, uh, man. That's the thing. Yeah. We're think... on the edge of the epidemic, bro. We are on the edge of... Yeah. There's an epi- I'm telling you because not only do we have social media coming into play and triggering all this dopamine for these young kids, but then the over-prescription of substances like Adderall to like these young kids. Which is speed, basically, right? Yeah, the yeah. lack of family dynamic. All these things come in to produce a catastrophe. Like this is going to be a yeah, really bad problem. It's scary shit, man. That's why like lately I've been becoming more cynical i don't want to it sucks but it's like i don't know it it seems that there is a price for everything because like even just like the law of polarity right with opposites are identical by nature with every good comes an equal amount of bad and the same thing with technology just take i don't know fucking cars for example like we can travel more places faster than we ever can before but they're also one of the leading causes of death like there's always a big big price for every piece of technology you just go back like the internet the internet has been amazing in opening people's mind. We're getting more connected. We're becoming more informed about all this kind of stuff. But it's also creating like this. I don't know, man. I don't know if you've seen the uh, cesspool of the human psyche, which I think is in entirely in YouTube comments and trolls and yeah, like. There's a I'm... big. What I'm saying, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's just as good as it is bad. And when I think when when a new revolutionary technology comes out, we always like to look at like this is going to save humanity, this is going to be so good, but they're not actually looking at, but what's the potential negatives? And then we don't really deal with those consequences until years down the track. And I don't want to be like a negative Nancy here and saying that all pieces of technology are going to be bad for us, but I don't know. I just feel a little bit... It's scary. It's scary. Look at social media, right? Like we're we're more connected. Right, we're, We're more connected than ever before, digitally speaking, but we're also the most disconnected we've ever been. And I don't think that's too far-fetched to say. I mean, like, depression, anxiety, suicide rates, as high as it's ever been. I'm not saying that's related directly to social media. There's probably, there's a fucking, probably a billion factors in play. But, yeah, there's always... It's a research chemical, bro. It is a research chemical. You know why? I do because blew my mind. human totally. technology is evolving faster than the human mind and body is. 
Yeah, so yeah, yeah. we don't really know how social media is going to affect these kids growing up now. And we don't, and also like, it's just, we're kind of setting us uh, ourselves up to, for another epidemic. Cause as far mm. as the cause of addiction, there are many factors that contribute like adverse childhood experiences right. and the Dis- environment. Disconnection. But the number trauma, one yeah, cause, yeah. if you go through neurology, the one commonality that every neurologist will get on board with is the AG first use. It's the number one cause of addiction, which just seems, sounds so simple. That makes but sense. But the earlier you use, the more likely, and it has to do with the brain being rewired and recircuited. No, that's true. Because, I, I, like, for example, some people don't think this is a, a big deal, but I've, I've tried, I think we talked about it on one of our previous chats. Uh, weed. I started smoking weed when I was 12, right? Which is, like, ridiculously young for a developing brain. Mm. And, you know, I've tried many many different drugs right all the ones that are supposed to be the worst ones for you and by far weed has been the most destructive and addictive substance i've ever experienced and i'm not saying that weed is addictive but i'm just saying that it's just it just depends on your biochemistry you know any substance like one substance can be super addictive for one individual and like another person can try it once and just leave it for the rest of their life you know what I mean? And like you're saying, like the earlier you use, I think that's a big factor because I started smoking so young. So maybe when I was developing as a kid, I don't know, I was smoking so much weed that it kind of became a part of my nervous system. I don't know what's going on there, but I, I do think, I agree with you, in, like the earlier you start using, the more addictive addicted you're going to be ultimately. Yeah, it's the one thing that we know for sure. We know that 100% in set in stone yet. I have moms, because I put my number in all my videos, reaching out to me saying, my nine-year-old is prescribed Adderall. Is that bad? Oh, my God. And, that's f- And this is a, like that's almost crazy. daily thing. I have a guy who's an addict, and he'll kind of tell me a story. And it always starts with, I was prescribed Ritalin when I was 13. And that's just another thing on top of the social media thing. Because I think that, like, you know, diagnosing a kid with ADD, like for all we know, this could be affecting their minds. Like they're on social media. There's so many things going off at once. It almost is like a replica of ADD. Well, what, you do you, got... what do you think ADD is? Do you, do you think that's like a, a new thing that has emerged because of our new lifestyle? Like with constant stimulation and social media and TV and instant demand like Netflix and porn, like. Do you think that plays I mean, a big part? ADD is, it's a real thing. Like, um, you know, it's an attention deficit disorder where it's a simple, simply put, it's where you're, you can't pay attention. But when you do pay attention, time. you're like insanely focused kind of thing. Cause I feel yeah, like I have but the, it, thing, but... the thing is now that there's so much emphasis on the educational system and it's so seen as the only pathway to success that a lot of parents live under this fear that if their kid doesn't do well in school, he's not going to do well in life. Dude. So underneath that yeah. fear, so there's two different types of peer pressure. There's antisocial and, and uh, pro-social. So, you know, yeah. young kids, we tend to secede to antisocial peer pressure, which is like delinquency, go yeah. and, you know, take a crap in your teacher's, you know, recycling bin, that kind of stuff. Now with adults, we have pro, they have pro social. Yeah, yeah. Pro social is like you know, go to church every week, uh, do well, make sure your Get kid gets grades. a college degree. Yeah. So the parents are underneath this peer pressure, and um, that causes them to say, "He's not making good grades. I'm going to take him to the doctor." The doctor gives the kids drugs, mm-hmm. and you know the parent just trusts the doctor. And like as far as promotion of substances doctors are like the number one because they have like their md in their coat and like you could trust us of course you're nine year old this oh you're wearing a white lab coat of course you must be right yeah yeah like if i came out i'm like i'm dr phil (laughs) you should (laughs) do this (laughs) that should totally be a segment ask dr phil and then you know people should write to you that'd be cool (laughs) it's it's mind-boggling to me that there's so much negligence of like what is going on with the youth and preventative measures for addiction. And unless there's a serious reformation through awareness, I don't think that things are going to get better. I think they're going to get worse. So like, that's why I'm out on YouTube pumping it and just saying like, if I could just make 10 people aware, 20 people, whatever, many people aware, then that's like my, just doing your part. How, however small or big. Yeah. I don't know, man. Cause I, 
I went, I go through phases, right? Well, I'll go through like this optimistic phase and I'll have hope for humanity and all that kind of stuff. But then fucking hell, sometimes I just lose hope. And it's not like I want to be a downer and not do anything. Of course, I'm going to do whatever I can, regardless whether or not I have hope for humanity or not. But it's really hard not to fall into despair sometimes about where humanity is going. Cause like you it really said, man, is. It, it, cause it's like you said, like technology is growing at this exponential rate, but our human consciousness hasn't caught up. You know what I mean? We still have the same problems we did decades ago. And maybe we'll always have these problems. Maybe it's just a part of being a human. I don't know. I don't know what has to happen for us to kind of wake up. But I would say something pretty catastrophic, like something catastrophic has to happen for us to be like, okay, we need to like rethink what we're doing here. But I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to get break my way into public speaking more and just like getting down a speech that kind of hits the nail in the coffin. Mm. You know, bringing up neurology like 74% of addicts use before the age of 17. And then uh, bringing up, you know, the percentage of people prescribed Adderall and then say this is an amphetamine. It does this, this, and this. And I mean, whenever you pull up all the information, you pull up the social media, it's just blatant. It's just in your face. Like, to yeah, me, like, yeah, yeah. a way to so. improve the future. And then drug education, like, as far as how it's done in high schools, it's like this massive hyperbole. And it's like an exaggeration of the truth, which is very small. Like, I wouldn't even call it. I want to say something an exaggeration of the truth. A lot of it's just lies. Are right. they um like what? You know, there's you put all these pieces together and you just present it to the public and I think that people will be like, "Holy fuck, like something's wrong here." Like if a doctor's going to prescribe like a 9-year-old Adderall, I think there's some loops that he should have to go through and the parents should be thoroughly aware of what it is and they should seek outside counseling. <laughs> right. You know and be I, aware of the negatives as considering well. Considering that. Yeah. You know, but they're doctors. They're able to just throw pills at kids all day, regardless of age. And then and it's, it's just it's, it's really bad in the U.S., isn't it? Like you guys fucking prescribe kids drugs really yeah. early on. Like it's I, as far as I'm aware, it's a lot worse over there than it is here. Like me mm -hmm. growing up in high school, like I knew some kids who took Adderall or whatever it was, uh, but maybe once every I don't know one every fifty kids or something. I don't know what the ratio is in high schools in the U.S. Oh, but... gosh. And then with college here, because there's such this <sighs> – there's such a <laughs> emphasis on education is the only way to success. And, like, I deal with this all the time. Like, one of the most common questions I'm <sighs> asked is a college student at, calls me and says, yo, I've been taking Adderall to pass my classes. What can I do? I don't know if I should quit or not. Mm. And that's kind of, like, the way it is because – I've been in that, that system with college and whenever you try your best and it's not good enough and you get that B or that C or whatever and you're striving for an A, it it really does hurt. Yeah, and then you find yeah, that, yeah. that not only numbs you out to that fact, but it makes studying so much easier. So like you study for like eight hours, it feels like it's only been two hours. And uh, it becomes almost like a crutch because you realize that studying comes easily. Like without Adderall, whenever I studied eight hours, it felt like eight days or something. Yeah, I but know what you mean. But that's, that's, that's what makes it scary though because that's what – it could be so enticing. Like imagine having a pill which makes you study eight hours straight and it feels so easy. Like how easy and tempting is it going to be to continually – Especially for these colleges. Yeah, especially college. Because like, I remember um, – you know, Adam, Psych Substance, he gave me one of his uh, ADD Five pills amps. or whatever it was. And I was like, all right, I'll try it just to, I'll take advantage and study. And de definitely made me very focused, chatty, I was concentrating, time went back, like went by much quicker than usual. But I don't know, man, like I always feel the next day, I felt like I was coming down of speed or something like that. Like I just, my body, yeah, felt like that, that, you know, that, that clammy sweatiness that you get. And then you don't, I don't know, it, I just felt gross afterwards. And that was just one, once. So I'm like, yeah, I'm never doing that again. Um, yeah, so I couldn't even imagine having that, like, every and day. And these college kids are just taking Crazy. all this Adderall in there and considering, like, what, is this, like, a long-term solution? Like, that's the first thing I would that would come to my mind. Because once you enter the workplace, you can't use Adderall to meet deadlines. It's a totally different environment. You're not given notice. Sometimes, like, 
you'll have a deadline in an hour and you have to do it and you can't just oh, shit. like it Adderall's like a crutch like it's a crutch that is not a viable long-term solution i mean most people know that they only take an adderall to get through college right but and what and what you're going to think as well though degree or that professional career well since you've like you know basically procrastinated all these assignments and just took a bunch of Adderall to get it done in a night you haven't really retained anything and you also haven't learned how to be punctual with time management and meeting deadlines so this you know what might help you in college will sabotage you in the workplace and I think a lot of these kids mm. don't understand that or you know I I've, I've, even if they're taking it illegally the last thing you want is to get some kind of drug offense record even if it's just a schedule three yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's not worth it. Graduate. You don't want that on your resume. You don't want to say I was caught with, you know, speed, you know, prescribed speed or whatever that wasn't prescribed to me. Yeah. And and, the, and I don't know, having an ego is very tricky as well because we've all been through it. You'll take a drug and you'll you'll rationalize it in your mind like, Oh no, this isn't this isn't so bad or oh, you know, I'll only take it a few more times or whatever the excuse is, but you just gotta people gotta realise that every single drug has an equal consequence to it whether it's in with whether it's physically emotionally mentally whether it's short term long term there's always a price for any single drug you ever take and i i don't know maybe it's because Adderall is a legal prescribed drug that people think that oh it, it's legal therefore it must be not as bad as these illicit drugs i don't know what it is but yeah it's just people don't see the the middle ground because whatever positive, and it, I find with drugs, I don't know if you would agree with this, but like the higher, the more profound the high is, the the more profound the downfall is as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Most I don't definitely. Know, yeah, I don't know if I agree with uh, Adderall and stuff. Because I remember my friend in class back in high school, he'd be like a really active kid, like very athletic. He can do backflips and shit. It was fucking crazy. And then when you take Adderall, he would just become like this drone like this zombie in class like a completely different person it's like my mom says that these pills help me study mostly it's like well i don't know it's like creepy man it's like you're a completely different person and maybe sometimes it's like you're saying people have that fear of their kids not doing well in school but maybe they have the type of personality that isn't supposed to be good at school and sitting down and just memorizing yeah, words. And, you know, maybe they should be doing athletics or playing a sport or do a martial art or, uh, you know, play an instrument or something like that. I don't know. I, I, everyone has, because school is completely built on the premise of like everyone. Oh, there was a fucking what, what's the thing? It's like they're trying to fit the same shoe for everybody. What's what's the what's the fucking saying? Like they're like teaching. That's the thing. One size fits all. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but yeah, they teach applied... everyone the same. Yeah. Yeah, in applied psychology, I learned that there's like you know they're they're considering changing the word intelligence to intelligences, as in plural, because they're saying now they know that there's seven different types. There's... I was gonna say that yeah, seven because school yeah. only, only tests two of the intelligences, which is linguistic and logical, which includes mathematics. And yeah. stuff like that, and that's what I was good at, but not everyone is good at maths, and it's yeah, not exactly cool. relevant to everyday life unless you want to become an engineer or something. Yeah, all, I'm all these parents that are just prescribing their kids Adderall. Like, my advice would be like, see if there's something else that ignites their interests. Maybe they're meant to be an entrepreneur. Maybe they're meant to be a basketball player. Maybe they're meant to do something yeah, else with yeah. their life that doesn't conform. You know what I mean? And sometimes <laughs> those are the most successful people ever. Yeah. And then also yeah. evaluation of diet because a lot of these doctors are handing out these pills and it's kind of like our, our jump to that is a solution, but we never say what is the kid eating? What is he drinking? Is he having any diet soda? Is he having problems at home fast whatever food. yeah because all these additives can ha- cause brain allergies which is kind of like one of those things that is slightly controversial but it's known to be pretty certain that it exists oh yeah uh, yeah which can make you know you seem like you have add when in reality you're allergic to monosodium glutamate because when you go to a doctor they test you if you're allergic to peanuts grass cats like really broad things oh yeah but as yeah, far yeah. as like the thousand additives they put in a big mac no they don't so yeah. like really evaluation of diet is so critical and that's also lacking there was someone that reached out to me that had a 
she was 28. She had, she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Now I'm not a doctor, uh, but they were giving her all these. What do you mean? Pills. I thought you were Doctor Phil. You lied to me. I should be. I should get it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's Doctor Phil. Yeah, but you know she was struggling, and then um, I basically asked her, you know, are your joints actually swollen? Is it just muscle pain? And she's like, oh, it's just muscle pain. I said, well, maybe try like some I would try in your situation is a water cleanse where you mainly eat just vegetables because there's actual food allergies that can make your muscles ache yeah and it can reset your body you like the 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 capacity for the body to heal is actually amazing if you just give it that chance yeah. you know yeah and people exactly. like even like eating i don't know let's say you break your hand right and then every single day you just smash it with a hammer never really giving it the chance to heal that's exactly what people are doing with their food drugs whatever it is they just keep doing the same destructive behavior patterns that doesn't even give their body the chance to heal and a lot yeah. easier said than done, so I, I completely empathize, especially when you have a lifetime of shitty habits. It's just really about taking it one small step. But it's, at it's a time. crazy to me that the doctor, because she ended up doing this water cleanse and vegetable cleanse, and she didn't have arthritis, so she's prescribed opiates for no reason. Really? She's allergic to something, yeah, and it ended up working. And they gave opiates out. for something like without even. For a food it. allergy. Okay. But it's like, for me, it's so crappy that the doctor never, like, said, hey, let's do a water cleanse before we go to extreme measure, measure like, giving you, like, a bunch of Oxycontin. Mm. Let's try something else first. Let's evaluate this. Let's, all right, for the next two days, have water and organic vegetables. Let's see, see if this is, could be a food allergy. Yeah, you know what I mean? They, they, they don't result to that. The Dude, They're like, same oh, thing what? happened to my girlfriend because she uh, had – she had, I would say has, maybe Slash still has, but kind of overcame it anyway. But anyway, she had a autoimmune disease. that uh, It's called Graves' disease. So it's an autoimmune disease that attacks your thyroid. And anyway, she was getting really bad. And then she went to a specialist and her specialist gave her two options because she was getting worse. She's like, all right, you can either get surgery and cut out the fucking thyroid gland, which I don't know. I don't think you have to be yeah, a doctor a to realize time. that without the thyroid gland, you're not going to have a good quality of life. So either get surgery, cut out your thyroid gland, or two, eat, uh, take radioactive pills every day that eventually kills your thyroid, which will most likely lead to surgery anyway in the long run. Those were the two options she had. Not, not, not like, oh, maybe try to change your diet, maybe try this, maybe try that before we go to extreme measures. Those were the two options, and I remember... Yeah, they jumped the gun real yeah, quick. Yeah, and I remember her telling me that, and I was so furious that they could do... And I know probably from this specialist point of view she's coming from a good place that's just her school of thoughts what she it's what she knows right but there was something really wrong with that in my opinion and so i tried my best to try and get her to eat a really good healthy diet eat more greens uh stay away from like the processed stuff especially like breads and pastas and things like that which yeah. is especially bad i'm not gonna say it's bad for everybody but it's especially bad for people with graves disease according to my, you know, am amateur YouTube research. But there's usually some truth there. And uh, But anyways, long story short, she ended up, you know, she's a fitness freak now. She works out more than I do. She eats super healthy. She went to the doctors and her levels are completely normal. So it's like she's all good. And it was fucking amazing, yeah. Just from diet and, and exercise. Yeah. It's like, oh, oh, are you sick? Sorry, mate. Straight to surgery. But what about if I change my diet? Nah, mate, no time for that. Fucking go. <laughs> Take some drugs. Sh shut your mouth. <laughs> yeah, and it, it gets to a point, like, even especially lately, it's so overwhelming. You know, I have to remind myself that helping one person at a time is what matters. Because I can yeah. get ahead of myself pretty easily. Because I do deeply care about just a person anybody you know like if there's a problem with some neighbor down the street that i never met it is my problem and that's kind of like how i've always been it's a part of my personality is being very compassionate wanting to help others and i've been helping a lot of people individually but as far as attacking like this drug addiction thing that we have going on in this epidemic and i honestly think it's going to get worse at the rate we're going mm -hmm. if i start jumping into those waters i get overwhelmed and i'm like Fuck it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, yeah. Pfizer back on. That's something I've been struggling with this week. The what, just like, like, you know, put my focus on. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah, focus yeah. person at a time. 
because this past week, that's something I've been struggling with where you're diving deep into neurology reports and reading all this stuff and you realize we're fucked. Like, it's <laughs> like I, that's how I feel. But I always have to go back and save one attic at a time. Just help one person today. Help one person. It's all you can do, though. Like, what what else are you supposed to do? Just give up and make yourself fucking world. miserable. I want to be the ginger avenger. The ginger avenger. It's it's heartbreaking, and like I have adolescents reach out to me through text, and like I don't respond because I know that their decision making is different than mine, and like I don't want to say something that they interpret the wrong way. For me, like of course there's a liability, but for me there's a sense of responsibility to not respond to those messages because if they interpret what I say the wrong way and go in and end up making a big mistake, I'm going to feel so guilty about that. But it breaks my heart how many, just how many adolescents reach out to me. Like I'm talking 15 year olds who identify themselves as, as an addict who want to get sober. And is I can't, it, is it see, usually I, with, uh, ice or just a whole, it's usually, whole uh, Xanax is the, Xanax. seems to be a very, so um, Xanax is huge these days, isn't it? Yeah, which is one of the most dangerous drugs. I like <laughs> she likes. Yeah, that's why I don't know what what is it's just the right proportion. Oh, I, I've never had it, but I could. I don't know. I don't trust my addictive personality, so I'd rather just not try any any new drugs. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of these kids are prescribed to Adderall or Xanax. Seem to be you know very common, and yeah. it breaks my heart because even if I could talk to this kid, what would I tell him? Like. What you know, the problem is like this shame based judgment, like parents will shame their kids. Like it's like you're talking yeah. to a 15 year old yeah. about their addiction. Like it's a dumb choice they made. They're 15 and it's like this shaming, shaming, shaming. Yeah. Yeah. Like I understand having a stigma and a boundary and saying that this person's on drugs. He's more dangerous than the average person. I need to be more on guard, mm. set more certain boundaries. But as far as like the shame and so then these kids, they can't talk to their parents about it because they just get fed a, a shame sandwich, which is probably why they're addicts in the first place. Uh, they can't go to like recovery support groups because they don't have those for minors. There's not a substance abuse counselor at their school. I'm like, what would I even tell this kid anyways? I would say talk to your parents. But the problem is the parents just don't get it. A, a lot, so yeah, a lot of parents wouldn't come from that place of understanding. Yeah, it, it's yeah, it's tough, man. Like what, what are your, like, what's your approach on drug harm reduction? Cause what I've noticed for myself anyway, like, you know, from, cause I've run this channel for like over three years now. And what I've noticed that you, with drug education is that you've got to be very careful with how you approach it. Because even the act of teach, educating someone about drugs is going to promote it on some level. Like, you know what I mean? Like, let's say if I was to educate someone on some research chemical that no one knows about. And yeah, sure. Let's say for every one person I help, there's going to be five more people. They're going to be like, oh, cool. What's this new drug? Like, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Because I'm a bit, I have a bit of mixed reviews when it comes to that kind of stuff. And that's why these days I'm a lot more careful with what drugs I do talk about. That's why I tend to just stick with the ones that everybody knows and not branch out to new drugs because it's like yeah i'm going to help some people with certain substances but at the same time you're going to get some kids who are just going to find out about a new substance or am i just crazy what are you what are your thoughts on this i, I mean i think that this. the cons and pros have to be weighed and uh sometimes the pros end up being a con so like you'll hear a pro like well, with every pro comes oh. a con it's the law of polarity it's by its very nature so, yeah, yeah. A pro is this substance feels really good a con is this substance feels really good. Hundred <laughs> yeah, percent, <exactly. laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. But uh, as far as like educating like the public, I think you know it's very important. It's very lacking because I equate it to like sex education. Like, of course, abstinence from all substances is the ideal. In like, oh God. it's the best form of uh, drug harm reduction. Never yeah. Yeah, abstinence is ideal for harm reduction, but is it reality? There's a difference no. between idealism and realism. Yeah, yeah. As far as reality, I don't think having that information out there, I think it better serves the public, not just for harm reduction, but for better understanding of the subjective experience. There's so yeah. many family members 
or people that, you know, have a family member that maybe used a substance and had a traumatic experience and they're trying to understand mm. why they used the substance, what the substance did. And uh, so it doesn't just help in harm reduction, but also furthering education on the subjective experience and uh, understanding what this actually does. Yeah. And that's some, you know, I actually had a doctor reach out to me and said uh, that, you know, throughout medical school, he wasn't really exposed to the subjective experience. So he knew the neuroscience and all this, that and the other. But he, he told me that he would have like a meth addict come in and cry and say, I'm quitting, I'm never going to do this again. And he looked so sincere, like he would never do it again. Then the doctor would see him a week later at the ER again and oh, again shit. and again. And, yeah. and he's trying to understand why. And he's going through the neurology and it doesn't make sense. But he said watching my videos helped him more than a lot of things because it was the first time he could From see the subjective eye to eye. Point, yeah. Subjective experience. This is what it was like. This is what went through my mind. Yeah. You know, forget the science. This is what it felt like. Yeah, it's very important, I think, to approach the subjective side. And that's pretty much why I started talking about uh, my psychedelic experiences and things like that, because there weren't a lot of people that were openly talking about these experiences. Um, I've definitely changed my approach, because when I first got into like ayahuasca, I was a very, I guess you could call it a psychedelic warrior or a psychedelic evangelist. You know, mm. kind of believing that these substances are the answer to everything. But then I learned the very hard way that it's definitely not. And like we're just saying, with every good comes an equal amount of bad. And that includes, like psychedelics doesn't get that exception. You know what I mean? I mean, of course, they help so many people transform in a very profound way and heal with their traumas and this and that. But then there are also a significant por portion of people who use psychedelics who get trauma, like get, have traumatic experiences and develop PTSD, derealization, depersonalization, HPPD, like all these kind of things. So yeah, I think you got to, it's a touchy subject, it is, but it's, it is, I feel that, but like drug education uh, is, it sucks so bad right now because it doesn't inspire any kind of trust. Like when they talk about these substances, it's like they exaggerate. I remember they showed us this is uh, your brain on ecstasy, and it like showed it like a couple 22 millimeter rounds went off in it. And I, I was like, Ah, uh, yeah, hell? I remember that. I, I did a parody Dude, on the, the scrambled egg one. Yeah. Yeah, I did research into that guy. It turns out he took 50,000 tablets of ecstasy in his life. Fuck. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, so that's too why much his brain looked like that. But it's like they didn't tell me their source, they didn't reference it, they didn't say this is what this guy took. And it just like I know they get this demonizing thing, but it doesn't inspire trust. Whenever you're no. saying that if I take ecstasy, my brain is gonna go on a frying pan and fry like an egg. But my friend took it, and he's still acing his classes like a week later. Right. He's actually better grades than me. So there's a lack of trust, but then it gets an, and also a lack of with harm reduction. It's like yeah, be abstinent, don't have sex until marriage. But we know <laughs> not all of you are gonna do that. No. And that's one of those things where that is a very touchy subject because um, in a way it could be seen as promoting by some and in others they would totally understand it. Like saying things to, a, you know, saying to the public that if you mix Xanax with alcohol, you're going to die. Right. Do you know the difference between derealization and depersonalization? Yeah, derealization is where you don't feel like objects are real and depersonalization is like a detachment of your head from your body. So wait, which one's the one that's like you think of life as some meaningless dream and you're just floating about? Which one's that? That's more of derealization. Okay, cool. I had that. Yeah, Depersonalization, it's like a very dissociative effect where I don't know, people that can relate this to this if like, they've taken a lot human? of human. I think that's what some people described it as. Depersonalization. What? Like you don't feel what human. Is... You don't feel... Yeah, you, you feel detached. So like whenever you take a dissociative like ketamine or... DXM or PCP, it's like your environment, like you walk into your house and like, you know, normally you just say, this is my house. Like I recognize it and you associate with that. Yeah. Well, you know, on a low dose, you'll walk in your house and you'll be like, you'll feel almost like you're in a stranger's house. Like you're just kind of detached from it. You don't understand it. But then at the really higher doses, you start feeling that with your own body. Like you'll look at your body and you'll start feeling detached. Like it's foreign, like it's a house you've never been in before. And that's yeah. like your own body. I haven't had and that. And that's no. depersonalization. That's crazy. And so you, you, someone had it for three years, did you say? My brother, yeah. Your brother, fuck. That's a long time, man. How did he yeah. recover from that? 
Huh? How did he recover from that? Uh, it really was just time. And um, he stayed isolated. I've talked to other people that said talking about it helps, but he kind of isolated. And then it really just took time. And it's one of those really weird illnesses because the person who has it looks completely fine and can function normally, but they're very uncomfortable. And the, usually, like for him, he was very anxious because there's always this thing uh, when you had something for like six months even, you always wonder, is this going to last the rest of my life? Like, yeah, I know like those aren't thoughts that shouldn't should be upplayed. They shouldn't be. They should be downplayed because this is something a lot of people go through. Most likely it's going to self-resolve. You're going to be fine. But it's really it's easier said than done when you're in it. And it's been six months, I imagine, or a year yeah. or two years. You're like, what if I don't? What if this doesn't go away? And doctors are like, we don't know what's wrong with you. When you're in it, you're in it. Because I remember after going mm-hmm. through like this crazy existential crisis after I did a uh, iboga, it was like, I don't know. I, I thought that I just fucked up my mind forever, and I'm never gonna be happy again. Like I genuinely believed it, and I've gone through experiences where like, I've gone through some pretty dark holes. And I've seen the light at the end of the tunnel, but this was so overwhelming on a foundational level that it just, it just tipped reality upside down. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that you're never going to get better. And there is like, like, I don't want to say for everybody that there's light at the end of the tunnel, because frankly, most people don't get through, not most people don't want to like push through it. And I think that's the, the secret between these really dark emotions. It's not to avoid it. It's actually to step into it and then break through it and again very 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 easier said than done for sure because some of these states are horrific but sometimes you just got to do it step in there you know be comfortable with the darkness because it's always going to it's it's like pain and suffering is the price ticket of being human it's the price ticket for existing in the first place we're gonna we're gonna go through pain and suffering whether we like it or not it's just about minimizing it and having a healthy relationship, I think. Because I don't, mm-hmm. I don't care how enlightened you are, you're still going to go through pain and suffering in one way, shape, or form. You can't... I don't know, man. Yeah, I feel you there. <laughs> I mean, I used to be the psychedelic nut. Tammy knows. I used to have these crazy shirts that had Jesus on them. I have one. You have... I have a DMT shirt. Try DMT? Yeah, <laughs> well, I was like... I was totally going to wear it, but I was like, no, I probably shouldn't wear it. No, you should. That's so funny. (laughs) That's hilarious. I remember finding that picture on Google and I was like, oh, that's the best. I sent it to my friends and everything. And then I found out that you fucking created it. That's the best. Yeah, yeah. I boosted it too. Like I paid to promote it. Yeah. (laughs) Hang on, your your microphone volume is a bit low. Is Is it me? Something. What's up? Is it low? Oh, that's awesome. Can I see it? Oh, that's the one I make. The sp- what does it say? The spiral... The spirit molecule. Oh, the spirit molecule. Okay, nice. That's sick, bro. I actually had a shirt on that I had to turn inside out because I didn't know, like... It says, can I buy some marijuana? And then it says, sorry, that's illegal. And then, oh, that you did turn Yeah, I turned it inside out. out. <laughs> so it says, uh, can I buy some marijuana? And then the guy responds, sorry, sir, that's illegal. And then I, the the customer responds, okay, I'll take a fifth of vodka and assault rifle, and I think I'm ADD, so I'll take some speed. Oh, <laughs> so like, a little, like, like a little like a uh, jab at that. Can I buy a joint? No, but you can buy vodka and, and gun. guns, <laughs> and guns, and you can get prescribed speed. <laughs> my my uh, laptop's dying. Let me get my charger real quick. Yeah, all good, man. To end on a on a good note, let's. Uh, I want to ask you, what is the myth, the biggest misunderstanding about drug addiction? Or, or actually, uh, uh, even a better question: What's the worst advice that you hear in this field? of recovering from substance abuse oh god there's so many mm-hmm. the top one that rings is like why don't you just quit she's so pretty and so cute and so but you just can't quit. there's so many i'm cycling through them in my head i mean i honestly think as a whole the biggest problem that we face is whether or not addiction is a morality issue and uh it's commonly still perceived as an immoral issue, which is why we have um, 
slurs like druggy, junky, this, that, and the other. Yeah. It's still seen yeah. as a moral issue. And um, yes, addiction, well, using a substance your first time's a choice. I don't think, you know, when I used a substance my first time, it wasn't my choice to become a meth addict. I didn't smoke pot the first time thinking, oh, I think I'm going to spend the next seven years of my life only doing drugs and then going to yeah. meth and ending yeah. up homeless. Yeah. I didn't choose to be an addict. But I did try to use substances my first time, and that led into addiction. But 74% of addicts used before the age of 17, according to Ted's report, mm. which basically was a survey that was given out to 670,000 addicts that were going into treatment Whoa. to identify Whoa. when they first used. That's a big sample so a yeah. lot of times when um, an ad you see an addict who's 30 years old and you shame base them or you judge them with shame, you're judging them for a decision they might have made when they were young. Uh, you know, when you process decision making differently, or it might not even have been a decision they made. It might have been a decision that their mother or parent made yeah. because the doctor yeah. said you should take Adderall. So I think the biggest problem I see, and this isn't necessarily advice that I see going out there, but this shame based judgment of looking down on addicts as if they're inferior people and they're not sick. Like, Granted, you should always be cautious around an addict. You should always be aware. You should always uh, understand that, you know, it's not their addiction that's scary, but sometimes the behaviors that go along with it, like, you know, stealing, you know that they they have an addiction. Yeah, so yeah, you got to be yeah. guarded and have your boundaries. You can't just see them as any other person. If someone walks up to you and says, I'm addicted to meth. You need to be on guard. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't <laughs> – and uh, I get that, but as far as looking down on the person – that's, you know, even this whole thing, this broadcast of is addiction a disease or is it not a disease? Not once have I seen anybody pull up the definition in the comments ever. It's all like this opinion. Mm. And I'm like, if you truly care, like you, all of a sudden you guys really care about grammar and you want to know if addiction is defined as a disease or not, then why aren't you pulling up the dictionary? I don't think that the reason these posts are going viral is because people care about the definition. I think they're going viral because they're feeding off that shame-based judgment that, you know, so certain people like feel like, you know, rather than focusing on what I could progress towards, I focus on what I've progressed past mm -hmm. as far as looking at other people, which it's really heartbreaking to see, which, you know, I see as be being one of the biggest problems with addiction. Well, the, the reason that people love Philip is because he's honest and open with his addiction. Dr. F I love you, Doctor Phil. I love you. Well, yeah. I love that. That's amazing. But you, yeah. but but addicts are not bad people. No, um, of course not. Yeah, addicts are sick people trying to get well, just like maybe a cancer survivor or whatever. And I'm sure you already heard all of that. But we're not bad people. We're just trying to live life and not be addicted. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I really appreciate what you're doing, man. It's very inspiring for sure. And it's like, I guess the whole mechanics of addiction is the same, whether it's with drugs, gambling, porn, fucking whatever it is. It's the, it's exactly the same mechanism that goes on in your psyche. And people like to differentiate between illegal drug use and everything else. Everyone's got addiction problems. You know, we don't yeah, judge dude, that. I swear to you, I swear to you, Tom, every time my phone dies and I'm, I'm out and I don't have a charger, I feel like my drug dealer just said, Oh, I'll, I'll get you later. Or, oh, I don't have any right now. <laughs> That's the exact emotion I get. Like that text message when your dealer's like, oh, I'm out of pot. I'm sorry. I'll get you tomorrow. Uh, and it's like oh. such a shattering it's feeling. Like my phone yeah. <laughs> yeah, my phone dies. I feel the exact same feeling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, e it's even the language. You know, language is the tool that the government uses to control our perception more than anything else, right? And even the word junkie compared to alcoholic it's like it's a bit ridiculous because someone who's an alcoholic has a drug addiction but how come they get to be called alcoholics and mm. then people who use illegal drugs get called junkies it's like a, a separation between the, the labels two. just honestly like and oh, to my... me like we've gotten past the racial slurs and the to an extent the gay bashing and those slurs that yeah. went with and I think, you know, I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but I would like to see a day and age where people saw terms like a druggy or a junkie as yeah. a slur against somebody who's suffering from an illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. But and get rid of the shame-based judgment. We'll never get rid of the stigma. The stigma actually is kind of healthy, but as far as like shaming people, like 
I just hope that I like anything I say opens up someone's mind to understand that a lot of these addicts used when they were adolescents. You'll be very hard sprung to find a guy who's 25, never drank alcohol or did a drug and says, I'm going to try drugs today. <laughs> and a matter of fact, according to Ted's report, only 2.6% of addicts started using after the age of 25 when the wow. frontal cortex is fully developed. Yeah. Uh, I'm referencing Ted's report so people could look it up for themselves. So, I mean, it's like I'm not just spitting out of my ass here. Yeah. It's just like you know, that it wasn't necessarily an adult that made that decision. Now, if you make the decision when you're 12 years old and it causes brain damage and emotional growth problems, like your emotional oh, growth gets yeah. stunted – then yeah. you turn 30 and you're an addict and everybody's calling you a druggie and a junkie. It just makes well, it worse. Yeah, it, it, it triggers like these what? negative emotions and it just, you know, it makes you want to use more and stuff like that. Yeah, I, th I think yeah, the, the it's judgment... It's just like not good. Nah, yeah, it's it's the whole judgment thing. Like, you know, we, we look down on people who use drugs uh, just because you had a, a good upbringing and you never had substance abuse problems or anything like that. So then you, when you look at someone using you know, crystal meth or heroin or whatever the worst drugs are, it, people tend to look down on them. Huh? She wants to hey, know hey. she can see. So I like what you just commented on, but my ex-husband came from a great upbringing. Can you see me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, but he was addicted to alcohol and uh, an alcoholic. But he came from a whole different environment, like good upbringing, really parents good. were yeah oh yeah I mean, yeah i'm just using that as an example because uh, because uh, uh for example with me i have an amazing upbringing like if you look at it objectively compared to everyone else i had no reason that i should have used drugs yeah. but i did and i was like one of the most addicted people to it like i had a yeah. really yeah because like i i resonate with you saying that you have an extreme personality i'm the same like when i get into something i really get into it yeah. and it's a blessing and a curse when it comes to work it's a good thing because I can get shit done, you know, like this whole YouTube channel and stuff. Like if I didn't have this obsessive personality, this would never happen. I wouldn't be speaking to you right now. But mm. it's got me into a lot of shit as well, for <laughs> sure. Uh, but I think it, it's just more the judgment, like you're saying. Like it's we need to just not shame people for doing what they, you know, for because they're into what they're into. And it's like you got to think of everyone is you living a different life. You know, people like to separate, like, no, I'm a unique individual and I'm completely different to you. It's like, no, you're both humans. Like, if your consciousness was to transfer some with someone else's consciousness, you would have done exactly the same shit they did their whole life. Because it's all environmental. Yeah. That's what I believe exactly. anyway. So I believe in that too. Yeah. I believe in that very strongly. Yeah. yeah. Well, if, you, if you tried to talk to my mother or my father, you would have a totally different response. But here I am as a product of my mother and my father who are you know, far whatever. Yeah. And does that make sense? Yeah, like, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. We all get each other. We're like... Exactly. We're, we're all Tommy, Tom, you, you, that's exactly what... I've thought that exact thing, like, what is a human? Are we just flesh beings or are we consciousness? Like, there's two different mentalities it's here. Both. Because Someone said it perfectly. It's like, we're, we're both... Wait, 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 we're both... Some, huh? Just how much weight does consciousness play? Because essentially what if my consciousness was born in your body with your environment, with your upbringing, with yeah, your I'm everything too much. Would I not be on the other end of this call right now? Well, we can never truly know that. No, we can't. No. Could the environment, our genetics, our bio biology, whatever is 99.999% of it. And our consciousness plays a little role. Or it could right. play a significant role. And that, role, and that you know? could be the free will that people speak about. I think it's mostly determined by environment. But I do think we, once we connect with that higher self or whatever you want to call it, I think you do have uh, the power of choice. Like once you become aware. But most people don't get to that place. That's the... When Dr. Phil told me that we were getting with your mate Tom, I was like, ah! I had like a party. My friend, I showed her the party. last video yeah. collab that y'all did. And she was like super impressed. Oh. I think she said hi to you earlier. I she yeah, yeah, it. she did, yeah. She did. yeah I appreciate yeah. it, guys. Well, we love the collab, by the way. Oh, my God, we love it. You did a great job. Sorry, yeah, I'm cleaning. It's all you, it's man. Like... You were the star of the show. I just did some <laughs> it was, editing. It was awesome. Spice oh, the it editing and... No, you did a great job. Yeah, I was very impressed. We've watched it like 15 times. Whoa. 
<laughs> uh, well, we'll end it on that note. Uh, just, do you want to plug anything? Like, uh, where can people reach you and all that kind of stuff? Uh, my of course my YouTube channel and at shamelessprotocol.com. Yeah. I'll there leave all the all... links in the show notes below. Yeah. Yeah. There all the time. Uh, if you post in the newsfeed, I will reply. Or you know, if you visit my channel, my numbers on it. If you or a loved one struggle with addiction, feel free to reach out to me for support or just anything, any questions in general. Sweet man. Well, I really appreciated this chat. Um, I'm sure I'm probably going to delete this in some way, shape, or form, and then we're going to have to do another one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's just going to be like this thing for the rest of our lives, like 10 years time from now. It's like, all right, this is our 100th podcast attempt. Hopefully this, is the, hopefully this one sticks. <laughs> now nah, I'll make sure I'll, uh, I'll get it done. Third time's the charm, as they say, right? Yeah, we love you, Tom. All right. Peace out. See you guys. Love you, man. Have Sweet. a good one.